I hope that the outcome of this short discussion is not to, in any way, have you leave here upset by some of the difficult content, but a buoyant in the knowledge that good science can be conducted in an impactful way to ensure that those who do commit the worst of crimes find that the policing and the legal systems are supported in identifying the who, when, what, where, why and how, and here at Staffordshire that our students are a key asset in this work. The nature of my job is that my lectures contain the most horrific of images. It is never my intention to upset, shock or dismay my students or indeed you good people. I do have to add a note, however, that it has always been my experience that those in attendance always seem to want more and more graphic information. It seems our human thirst for the macabre is never fully satiated. Forgive this slide, but I do use it on every lecture to save any material ending up on social media sites, etc., which could cause great distress to any family or friends of those we discuss for educational or research purposes. I have found it best to keep it in our family. Also, I shall touch upon some recent criminal cases without giving locations or names, as the science is proving fascinating and is part of the real-world testbed for our laboratory-based studies. And if you do break those rules, remember, we know how to bury the bodies. And so if we're all sitting comfortably, we can begin. Now, murder has been well documented since biblical times with the story of Cain and Abel. Our thirst for details have not waned since the time of that story, and yet many individuals in the UK disappear every year with the suspicion that they've been killed unlawfully and their remains hidden in an attempt to evade the law. A quick look on Google will show you very publicly the scale of the problem. Last year in the United Kingdom approximately 200,000 people went missing, of which 5,500 of those cases had a fatal outcome, which can range from suicide to accidents and misadventure to violent crimes. How do you find those persons who've been murdered and placed in shallow, hidden, clandestine graves or aquatic environments such as a lake is a key question of our research and part of the topic of this presentation. The use of laboratory scientific techniques and how they move into the real world will demonstrate the power and impact of science on our society and on our students. The use of chemical analysis, in addition to other search methods ranging from victim recovery dogs to ground penetrating radar, in order to locate human remains, has found its way into the American judicial system. Although the research methodologies were not ready at the time, this suggests that our technique development, that of chemistry, has a potential to aid in the detection of human remains, although this area of research still needs further exploration. A little audience participation is never a bad thing, so I have a question for you to think upon. It's an awful thing to ask anyone to imagine, but for the purposes of this presentation, please humour me. You have committed the worst crime imaginable, the unintentional killing of a fellow human being. Confessing to the killing is not an option, so you're left with disposing of the evidence. Where do you go? How do you do it? How can you ensure success in burial and in evading capture in doing so? Take a field such as this. Where do you start? You see our problem. Where do we start in attempting to define where on planet Earth and landmass UK do we start to hunt for the evidence to assist a police inquiry? Whilst you cogitate upon this most difficult of issues, I shall carry on with considering the interesting toolkit for finding clandestine bodies. If an open field is proving problematic, imagine being faced with a scene such as this. The environment may not be land, but stretches of water such as large ponds, drainage ditches, etc. Can anyone see anything peculiar or wrong with this picture? Despite it being front and centre, it is often overlooked. Namely, that I've placed a body, a tactical dummy, not a real person, I hasten to add, in the foreground as part of a drowning scenario I created for teaching a few years ago. It is indeed a beautifully slightly macabre photograph. As we go through this short presentation, please do remember that we receive no funding for this particular research. We have had a self-funded PhD student, but everything else has been achieved and has been done so through innovative back scratching and collaboration, bartering and through the formation of a consortium of individuals, chemists, geophysicists, police and anthropologists, who believe that the impact of this research and what it brings to police investigations is more important than the need to hunt for large grant funds before starting.
And of course the use of our most precious asset, our students, has facilitated this coal face work. Just a few vignettes or visual sound bites of existing techniques that we wish to complement, not replace. Here we can see police using a traditional technique of searching on their hands and knees. This is a dog's nose. Police dog searches prove invaluable as a service, but they can indeed be fa fallible. Geophysics works. When the techniques work, they are loved, as in the Fred West case, but often they do not yield results and then they can be pilloried. A JCB digger is a sure way to find something. You can dig it all up, but this destroys valuable evidence and context and can cost a lot of money. Now, it's not time to go into it, but bodies break down and decompose in a reasonably defined way in terms of their breakdown of proteins, fats, sugars, etc. And it's these chemical structures we've been focusing upon over the last decade. I shall not go into the chemistry techniques, but do feel free to look on YouTube for gas chromatography mass spectrometry, which has got some good animations, etc. These are our laboratories, and this is our kit that our students use to very good effect. We have been fortunate, if that's the right word to use, to work on some police cases developing the techniques further. Difficult terrain such as this, an aquatic environment in a very isolated location such as this, and hope prof profile cases. Uh, apologies for flying through these, but time's at a premium. But we did want to alert you to the reality of the work undertaken here. And if you wonder just how easy it is to dump a body, look at this demonstration by a colleague in a ditch in Ireland where the bodies of six women are still being sought. Just as a quick aside and to show this use of students in our research is not a new phenomenon, here is one of my students from my days at the University of Derby. She came to help us here at Staffordshire with the BBC Countryfile TV programme with Michaela Strachan on a news item which still today holds their record for being the strangest item they've ever covered. So, in using the Crime Scene House Garden as our test bed laboratory and the amazing dedication of students for over a decade, we have chipped away at developing chemical techniques to identify chemical markers that can save police investigations time and hence money in seeking the likely hot spots where to dig, narrowing down search areas, making the search area that I showed a few slides back a little easier to navigate and hunt for clandestine burials or evidence thereof. The following slides are then, if you like, a pictorial forensic evidence board of the successes with journal articles published, students having presented posters and oral presentations of their work at the British Conference for Undergraduate Research, at various forensic conferences in the UK and indeed Europe, at the International Association of Forensic Sciences and at the Houses of Parliament, for posters in Parliament and of course at GradEx and our Staffordshire Postgraduate Research Conference. So in summary, there clearly isn't time to talk through this work in its entirety but please do look me up, look us up on ResearchGate, the University's e-store etc. You can have a look there at the posters and papers and the new knowledge that students have contributed to creating. Students are invaluable for many reasons their enthusiasm, energy, curiosity, and the fact that they are cost neutral. They more often than not rise to the challenge seeing the importance of the work as not just to get credits for their degree. We offer them real world challenges to increase their sense of pride, achievement, and their employability in the real and harsh world outside. Over enough time with small pieces of work, a much larger research outcome is available that outreaches even that in the time of a PhD study. This new idea of a hub and spoke project we're developing where a central project is harvested to a number of student projects promises to help direct the work as we enter the second decade of this staff student research partnership. I'd like to thank you for listening and in particular to thank my colleague Alison Davidson for managing these projects for a number of years. Thank you.